Welcome to the Ceramics for Social Change panel. I'm Michelle Kless. I'm the moderator. My background is a combination of arts management, artist, arts educator. I have an MFA in ceramics and I have a master's in arts management. Currently, I'm the director of engagement at Union Project, which is a local arts and community nonprofit right here in Pittsburgh. This panel is comprised of artists, arts and social justice administrators, and teaching artists, and we each have a different approach to using ceramics as social change. Sharif Bey is an associate professor of art and art education at Syracuse University. Yes, woo. Syracuse, Syracuse. <laughs> <laughs> he conducts workshops and fa facilitates collaborations in the visual arts for all ages. His work ranges from functional vessels to sculptures and adornment, which are influenced by function, ritual, and identity. <laughs> Originally from Wisconsin, Lauren Carley has worked in Guatemala City, Spain, and Puebla, Mexico. She was a post-bac student at the University of Nebraska before completing her MFA at Kansas State. She's been a resident in Mexico and Spain, and she continues to write and make from her home in New Mexico, while she also works as a full-time middle school and high school teacher at Desert Academy. <laughs> Milo Berezin discovered at an early age the joy inherent in making and building. As Union Project's arts education coordinator, he shares that sense of power and accomplishment with young learners. A certified educator, he has taught throughout Pittsburgh, including the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Children's Museum, Pittsburgh Public Schools, and obviously Union Project, too. Thanks for clapping. I think it makes us feel good. <laughs> They will each share their experiences, their ideas, and their reflections from their social art projects. We're gonna go one by one. Their projects were designed to engage the community and use art to facilitate deeper conversation. And these projects have taken place in a variety of venues, classrooms, community centers, universities, and museums across the country. We felt like it was very important to show the different ways you can use ceramics knowing that your community and your venue will always shift. After each panelist shares an introduction to their work, we're gonna have a roundtable discussion using a few guiding questions. And finally, we'd like to walk through an activity on recognizing privilege with you and do a share back and a reflection afterwards. We have a very, very robust hour and a half, and these guys do not stop talking. In all of our conference calls and meetings, We've, we've really enjoyed asking each other difficult questions and hearing the different responses. We have very, very different backgrounds. Our real goal here is that we will be able to inform attendees about the role of social art in the world, equip them, you, with ideas, and empower more artists to get involved. So through the conversation and the exercise, we're gonna challenge one another to push past viewer engagement and dig deeper finding ways to utilize ceramics to spark conversations, expand viewer perception, raise up underrepresented voices and stories, and even drive visibility and funding to address social inequity. Cool? Let's get started. Sharif is up first. Hello and welcome, everybody. Um, there are a couple of things I want to say to foreshadow this presentation. First thing is that I'm not going to show any images of my work. Um, you'll see stuff of mine, and I guess you can find some of the shows in the Ansika catalog. But one of the things about my work that I want to point out is that probably 95% of it, it is made at home with very minimal facilities. And I know we have commercial sponsors here that help us make the kind of work that we want to make and sponsor Ansika. And I'm not going to cast any dispersions against any of those corporations or companies, but we don't really need corporations to work in clay, right? And that's an important thing to consider as we think about um, marginalized communities. And we also don't want to assume that because communities aren't part of our larger institutions and those who are reflected in the world of clay may not be reflected in Nsika, it's important to consider some of the conventions that keep underrepresented people 
out of institutions like this. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about some of our conventions, um, specifically uh, with regards to how we think about possibilities of working with clay in the classroom. You'll hear me talk a lot about school art. I should hit my time on the back. School art and um, or prescriptive lessons. And again, the challenges associated with them is that they're typically limited or based around these four or five bullets. I guess you could see them somewhere, am I right? Because I don't, I don't see where they are. I can't see, okay. So obviously we have a limited amount of time, we have a limited amount of budget, we have limited space or facility, um, class size determines a lot. And of course, I like to think that we wanna make sure that what we offer to young people or old people um, is inclusive with regards to accessibility. Um, the, the thing that I learned about this in my 30 years of working in the classroom as a student or as a teacher or otherwise, is that uh, in many regards, anytime you alter the conventions of language, um, I avoid uh, words like project or assignment because they, uh, they kind of don't really support the notion of a continuum. So, so things like, let's experiment. So if we're trying to, we're, we're trying to solve a, a case or we're trying to uh, cure cancer, we don't bring projects to the table, right? We bring new questions, we bring new information and we challenge information and we continually think about this. So if we're all expecting to bring the same product and you as a teacher know what you're gonna get out of your students, then to me that's a problem. I think that we as teachers should continue to be learning. So with regards to thinking about these things, I think any time we alter how we think about time, how we think about materials, how we think about space, class, accommodations, changes the scope of what's possibility and how we engage in it. So the, the notion or the uh, assumption is that, wow, if we have more, it's better. Sometimes working with less alters how we engage and results in a more fruitful experience. So I like to think about this term of querying curriculum, which promotes the notion of finding unique uh, entry points for engaging in concepts, materials, or spaces. Here are my research questions. Uh, what can we learn through materials processes when we do not restrict or limit ourselves to teaching techniques or gearing our efforts toward finished products? I think it's an, firing work is overrated with regards to teaching and learning and engaging. If we're thinking about where we can plug it in, we're already limiting possibilities. How do we foster our own creative quests, fueled by curiosity and gratified by discovery, if we as teachers or artists are not creating circumstances in which we witness unexpected discoveries made by students? In other words, if, if I am truly engaging in this space as an artist, researcher, teacher, that means that I'm learning every day. Kids are changing every day, the world's changing every day, so should we. Clay's changing every day. That feldspar that you mined in 1991 is not the same feldspar that you mined in 2018. The glazes are not the same. So here is one uh, experiment that I did years ago with a group of fourth graders. And um, I dared not to call it a piggy bank project because there is a convention of piggy banks. So we talked about volume, we talked about mass. I showed them with, what a cup of quarters looks like. I showed them what a roll of quarters looked like. And we just made it hump, mump, Hump, 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 I like that. Hump and slump molds and created these kind of uh, objects, essentially working with nothing but newspaper masking tape and clay. Now, I, I have to say that we used underglaze as an electric kiln in this case. But you'll see cases when I don't. So piggy bank could be a Porsche bank. And I don't know if this is an armadillo or a turtle, but it still rocks. Um, the other thing, this is actually fresh off the press last week. Uh, David McDonald and I did a workshop here in Pittsburgh. And sometimes it's nice to think about the relationship between uh, structure and freedom. And I think we as facilitators of art experiences are always kind of trapped between how much freedom to offer and how much restrictions. The, the, the students are begging for stricture, structure when you're giving them freedom. You say, paper, you know, what font, right? How many spaces, right? They're asking you, does this have to be 20 inches tall, right? So there's, there's always that question of what the framework is. So our uh, project was about surface treatment, and we did a bunch of different surface design. This isn't, is this, this isn't advancing. Is it moving forward for you all? Okay, so we're, 
mutually stuck. Okay, I got it. Maybe my thumb is limp. I think my thumb is limp. <laughs> At any rate, um, we kind of had this way of booking and book ending this project that created a sense of structure. So David made the bases and I made the centerpieces and we kind of worked totemically. And the beauty of, of totemic working is it, it's, it's this way of kind of inclusively working with people that, you know, inevitably it's going to come together because there's going to be a finite beginning and a finite end. Uh, so, so this notion of totems, spirals, circles, in my view, they're, they're, they're wonderful you know, scientific models for inclusion. Um, here's another experience, speaking of combating school art. I had, uh, it was a teacher that was up the hill, and she said, uh, I want to come down with my kids and do something with you all that we can't do in our classroom. So this is like 45 uh, fifth graders. So I said, okay, I'll mix up 1,000 pounds of clay and see what's possible. We did kind of an um, exquisite corpse lesson where we're making, uh, I didn't say body parts. I said, let's do some limbs and some torsos, and let's come together and put them together. Again, we had a lot of material, but we didn't have a lot of time. So we're pushing back, again, on the conventions. Seeing the kids initially very, 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 very apprehensive before they get started, because they've never seen 50 pounds of clay on a table. But then I go and I kind of wrestle with the clay and say, just do something. And then they, they get liberated and they join in and start thinking about scale, thinking about objects and proximity to their own bodies. And of course, possibilities emerge. So here's the fruits of their labor. And I did this project again, but this time working kind of laterally and totemically with a group of uh, it was like all city arts council kids um, in uh, Oslo County, North Carolina. And we went out into the, the parking lot and with picnic tables. And again, having this much space immediately compels students to interact differently. This is another project that I, I, I wanna talk about. The other aspect of the way that many of us teach is we think often about, uh, about issues of control. Um, to, to, to run a curriculum effectively, we have to know where we're going, we're the teachers, we have to be in charge. There's something kind of patriarchal about the way that we think about how we exist in these spaces. And we don't feel like um, thinking on your feet is a good thing, because we're supposed to know what we're doing. And I think that it's a really important thing to gauge where our students are. So Peter Biesiger and I did this project with a group of freshmen, and we discovered, we mixed a, a, a couple of hundred pounds of clay with them, and they were immediately kind of activated by slamming the clay into the clay barrel. And I said, what, what can we do with that? How can we push that aspect? So I ran in the other room, and um, Peter was like, yeah, let's, I put a piece of canvas on the wall, and I just said, let's just throw 400 pounds of clay at the wall and, and see where that takes us. Again, we had no idea where we were going with this. And of course, we're continually whispering. So this kind of makes it more along the lines of, of research and taking advantage of not only the visceral aspect of the material, but the visceral aspect of the space. There's something possible here that we can tap into. So then sculpting and utilizing the outcome. So then I said, well, you know what could be cool? If every student goes back now and cuts out like a cinder block mass of the collaboration and takes it back to their own individual space and works on it for a few hours. They're having a lot more fun than it appears. <laughs> and then going from there to reassembling the blocks and building something with the blocks. So again, I had no idea, we had no idea. It became this wonderful experience. We didn't fire anything, we just slated the clay back up. Um, and it, it, it's great when we can, but the point is that we don't have to. So this idea of pushing us to think about something in a different way is what my teaching is often about. Here's a, another uh, experiment where, can we resist the radial nature of the wheel? So any material you get, get on that wheel and see if you can avoid making a circle. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right, um, so I work for Union Project, as Michelle said. We're a Pittsburgh-based community arts organization and ceramic studio. Uh, we describe our mission as uh, we use the arts to bridge gaps between communities. 
Uh, through all of our arts and community programming, we look for ways to bring artists and community members together to increase engagement, encourage conversations between people who are different from each other, and ultimately build. I'm much shorter than Sharif, unfortunately, I'm so, tall. so, I'm so yeah. tall. better. Yeah. All right, <laughs> short people problems, um, <laughs> and work toward building a more inclusive community. Uh, I joined the Union Project in early 2016 as the arts education coordinator, and I manage our studio programs, such as classes and, and camps, as well as partnership arts education programs with groups throughout the city. So I'll speak a little bit from uh, an organizational perspective versus a classroom teacher. Um, we work with a lot of different kinds of groups, uh, and that's everything from schools to shelters to rehabilitation programs, job training, religious groups, out-of-school programs, pretty much whatever you can imagine. Um, and when we're uh, invited to groups, to work with groups like this, um, it's a little different from a classroom teacher in that we have a more limited amount of time, and there really is an expectation of work being project-based. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of those projects that we've worked with. Um, it, in designing these kinds of group programs, we find it's really important uh, not to go in with the expectation of using a sort of preset curriculum or catalog of offerings like you might see at a lot of arts organizations. Um, my job is to work really closely with our partners to first cultivate those relationships, get to know the students and their specific needs, goals, and interests, and really meet them where they are. And after getting a better sense of their goals, together we can design content that'll be a, a fit. So it ends up being incredibly, incredibly custom. Um, this, I forgot about slides. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so here's just a few images, we'll move through. <laughs> so this way of designing um, programs, it can be really challenging. Uh, it is incredibly inefficient, but I found it also leads to much deeper impact and is especially critical in underserved communities. Not everybody's needs are the same, and you can't meet everybody's needs the same way. Um, I'll give a few quick examples of some of these kinds of programs. Um, the first one is a uh, residency that we worked uh, on with Pittsburgh Public School students. Um, and so for this group of tweens, uh, we worked on a uh, unit, a cross-curricular unit around self-reflection. You know, what do tweens care about at that point? They're figuring out who they are. Um, and th so this group studied um, West African, Egyptian, and contemporary symbol systems, uh, and then developed their own set of symbols with personal meaning and relevance, and then created uh, vessels, sort of incorporating those symbols, thinking about what they might contain, how they might, con how it might contain themselves, uh, sort of self as vessel, vessel as self, um, which seems like kind of heady stuff for fifth graders. But in, <laughs> in making it about them, you can see they really took ownership of the project. Uh, they showed, uh, by the end of it, they had something they were really proud of, really excited to get back from the kiln. Um, <laughs> just really enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> in, in, so in arts education, one way I, I think of fighting inequities is really remembering that every group has such vastly different needs and you have to meet people where they are in order to create pr arts programming that is going to be relevant to them, that's gonna get that kind of response. Uh, and clay as such a tactile medium is a really wonderful entry point to self-expression. It's a great tool for developing those problem-solving skills and for demonstrating the value of, of failure and of persistence through failure, failure that a lot of kids are still working to develop. Um, so I don't, I'm not forgetting the slides this time. I actually don't have a slide for the next thing I want to tell you about because it's just about to begin. Um, there's a program that we'll be starting next month in collaboration with a group called Creative Citizen Studios. Uh, who offer art classes to, and exhi exhibition opportunities to adult artists with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, together we designed uh, Citizen Clay Collective, which is a year-long pilot program working with a, uh, a group of artists with disabilities to train them to design, create, market, and sell their own line of production pottery as a group. Um, 
We'll um, also be working with uh, some of the local handmade markets in Pittsburgh who are going to be providing table space and also training our citizen artists in aspects of sales and customer engagement. Uh, and in turn, we'll be working with the markets to help increase their accessibility through strategies like sensory-friendly areas and other ways to make it more accessible to people of different abilities. When we talk about social change with this program, it's not just about creating opportunities or a sense of empowerment for artists with disabilities, though that's a big part of it. It's also an opportunity for the general public to see people with disabilities in a different societal role, not as recipients of care, but as capable and unique artists. It's a chance to build connection between our citizen artists and the greater community and other vendors and help uh, shift pers perspectives and help Pittsburgh become a more welcoming place for people of all abilities. Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about uh, another thing that comes up a lot in, in an, arts organization, art, an arts organization, and that's outreach. Um, and when I'm talking about outreach, I'm talking about the quicker hands-on experiences, festivals, other events with the wider public, um, and working with folks who might be experiencing clay for the first time. So I'm sure anyone from an arts organization has been invited to dozens of these kinds of events to uh, provide an activity. Um, since we have so many of these opportunities, invitations, Union Project is really interested in coming up with uh, innovative ways to use outreach to do more than just experience clay hands-on, but also to build deeper connections to each other uh, and to our community spaces. So I'll talk tell you about a few of those projects we've developed. Um, the first one and our longest running is called the Thousand Birds Project. Um, when we uh, bring this project to a space, we invite participants to come and make a small bird out of clay. Uh, and then we ask them to write a message of hope to another community member. We keep the birds they made. They don't take them home. But in exchange, they can choose a fired bird from a previous session with a message from another community member. So it fosters this connection between sh strangers through the sharing of art and hopes, encouraging a pay it forward spirit. The great thing about that is seeing that spirit carried forward even beyond that single experience. Uh, this project has actually inspired a group of teens to reach out to us because they were really moved by the project and they wanted a way to share it too. So we brought them on as Union Project's teen ambassadors and they've been helping us run the project in new settings around Pittsburgh and they've helped it continue to evolve as well. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone in the audience uh, was at Union Project last night, um, but a couple of the teens were there um, after the school tragedy in Parkland, Florida, uh, our teens again approached us and proposed running a variation of Thousand Birds just for those students. Um, the residents of Parkland had solicited letters of hope from around the country for their students, and our teens thought it would be really powerful to bring the community together to create birds and write letters of hope specifically to send to those students of Stoneman Douglas. So I hope if you were at Union Project, you participated. Um, a couple of other projects. Um, so this uh, one is called Community Blooms. Uh, when we developed this, we were thinking about uh, the power of collaboration and also sort of hyper-local engagement with a space and place, uh, as well as um, we, we developed it for uh, initially for an Earth Day. So it was also we were also thinking about ways to celebrate the Earth and environment. Um, so for this, uh, we. Um, invite community members, it's time to make flower blossoms, which we fire, uh, add stems, and then they all get planted in an outdoor garden that is sort of blooming and growing and changing year round. Um, in the summertime when we run this, we'll also invite participants to create seed bombs with the same terracotta clay that they're using, um, along with uh, soil and seeds, and then they can take those home to also uh, grow living flowers that will benefit regions butterflies and bees. Um, projects like this uh, create greater ownership over immediate community spaces. I often see people cleaning up trash from the garden or pointing out favorite flowers to folks waiting for the bus or occasionally even plucking a flower, which is okay because it allows it to keep growing and changing, just like our community. Um, finally, uh, another collaborative group artwork. Um, lately, uh, we've been thinking more about how to create a sense of belonging uh, to the community for our space itself and give the people that we work with a sort of sense of ownership over the space. 
Uh, and from that, we developed the Clay BCs. Um, so we uh, community members have been creating these relief tiles, uh, each with a single letter of the alphabet. Um, and as we collect a library of these alphabet tiles, we've been begun spelling out welcoming messages throughout the building, creating sort of these shared messages composed of many voices from the community. And we expect this to continue to evolve. Um, these kinds of outreach activities bring people together to collaborate and take a risk on something new together, which can start to create those bonds. Uh, we fill our space with diverse people working together toward a shared goal, starting conversations, and making people more conscious of their immediate community and the physical spaces. Uh, through this kind of collaborative public art, we hope to create a sense of ownership over public art and those community spaces. And once you've developed that buy-in, it becomes easier to inspire snowballed engagement and action, such as with our teen ambassadors. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you so much for coming. Um, community is really important to me, and you guys are my community. And as fellow teachers and educators and um, activists, um, I hope we can continue this dialogue and continue learning from each other. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs> um, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. And I moved to Guatemala City after I got my art education degree. So I taught middle school art for two and a half years in Guatemala City. And while there, it really impacted my view of craft. And I started to think about how craft was used in daily life. Um, what I connected with most while there were the textiles. Women were wearing peels, that's their blouses. And they contain their identity. Just from the pattern, you can tell what village a woman is from. And I also embraced the community aspect of their culture, and it's become a really important part of me today. Um, my interest in bridging cultures through social art um, started while teaching, and I didn't even identify it or name it as social art at the time. Um, my favorite project that I did with a teacher in Wisconsin um, was that we took we had students take pictures of 27 um, sacred spaces in their life, and then we had them trade pictures. We paired them, and they created photo montages using those pictures. Um, students from both sides learned about each other's culture and their lives. Living in Guatemala really set the foundation for how I view the role of craft objects in the world and my desire to bridge cultures, because I saw good things and things that could be improved in both cultures. Um, after that, I came back to the United States to pursue my ceramics career and, and learn and grow as an artist because I felt kind of fake being an art teacher and not an artist. Um, so I went to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for a po my post back, and then I studied at Kansas State University. Um, a few years later, during right at the end of grad school, I went back to Guatemala and I had this strong desire to stay connected with the people that had become kind of like my family there. And so when I went back, I made mugs inspired by Guatemalan patterns and gave one to my close group of friends there. Um, one of the girls was adopted and lives in Madison, Wisconsin. I now live in New Mexico and then the other two live in Guatemala City. And so every time we use these mugs, we think of each other. And so it's the symbolic connection that we have between our, our group of friends there. Um, grad school really made me define my purpose as an artist. And that is to visually communicate something. And even now as a teacher, I try to empower my students by saying, if there's one thing that you could say to the world through your artwork, visually, that's what, that's what we're doing. We're visually communicating. What do you want to say? And my personal answer to that question was that I want people to approach each other um, with curiosity rather than fear of differences. And so through my artwork, not just in, I, I try to embody that in the objects that I make, the physical object, but also then in how they're used. So I started thinking about how they can enter the world and how that impacts the work itself. 
Um, so one of the first social projects I did after graduate school was called Cultivating Community Through Shared Experiences. And I did this at the Beach Museum of Art. Um, when participants walked in, they chose a mug, and I had made them in pairs and set them on two different tables. And then they found their partner for conversation by matching the pattern on their mugs. Um, the first session that we did was, oops, I'm gonna go back one. Um, we paired people from a retirement home in the community with people from Fort Riley, which was a local base. So their commonality was um, women who have partners in the military. So we were pairing different generations. And then about halfway through, we had them find people with the same color handles. So our groups of two turned into groups of four. The second session, the commonality was students studying leadership skills, and we drew students from Kansas State University and from Job Corps. Um, then they, they shared tea and conversation over the mugs, and we talked about how, I think it's really important as a teacher and community educator to set the stage, to set your expectations. So when people entered, we talked about how the traditional tea ceremony um, is about humility and appreciation of beauty and grace. And so I encouraged them to enter their conversations with the same kind of mindset. Um, for me, my most reflective time when I feel most centered is when I'm out in nature. And during graduate school, I would often go to the local Kanza Prairie and take a hike around there. And so all of the patterns on the mugs were inspired by the four seasons that I observed at the Kanza Prairie and hoping to carry that sentiment into the object as well. Um, this, so for example, was a fall um, image that, of, of the big blue stem grass on the Kanza Prairie. Um, another project that I have done that actually just happened at Fort, um, at Fort Union, Union that's, that's local, <laughs> at the Union Project, um, was weaving dialogues. And I really believe in collaboration. Um, partly, ideas grow on each other. I'll have an idea, and my collaborative partner will have a better idea, and then I'll have an idea that branches from that. And I really feel like it's not just two brains, but they, they even grow more. Um, so I really seek out collaborative partnership, and not just as an artist, but also with other institutions or organizations as well, um, and, and in other disciplines. So for Weaving Dialogues, um, I did this with Jenny Hansen Gard, and we made pairs of mugs collaboratively. She throws, I hand build. Um, she uses porcelain primarily, and I use earthenware. So as far as making, we were on oppo opposite spectrums. So we really had to compromise, and we had to find ways to communicate and find ways that worked for both of us. Um, so then we, we made the pairs of mugs and then embroidered into the tablecloth a starting prompt, which said, describe an experience that has changed you. So the first people that came to participate in our project, we had five tables with five pairs of mugs and five tablecloths. They sat down and started their conversation with our prompt, and then at the end of their conversation, they left a prompt for the next group. So, for example, this one was, what in your core drives you? So the next iteration, the next people came and sat down and started their conversation there. And then they again left a prompt. And so this series of statements or questions are glimpses into the conversation that has been had over these pair, this pair of mugs and over this tablecloth. So the idea is that we have a symbolically connected conversation only changing out the people in that setting. Um, this has traveled to, we started it in Newark, Ohio. We've gone to Portland, Oregon, Las Vegas, New Mexico, Macon, Georgia, and now we just did it um, two nights ago here in Pittsburgh. So the idea is that we're having a symbolically connected conversation around the country. Another project that I've done 
is Project Canary with my collaborator, Nicole Gugliotti. And this also happened at Union Project yesterday. Um, we have a growing collection of stories that we have anonymously had submitted to us. And we have tagged, coded each one with a number. And artists come and make a craft object, and it's open to more than just clay. And they pick a story to inspire their artwork. They can also submit their own stories. And all the stories are stories of injustice. And so then after the work is fired or finished, um, you can see there's a coded number on the back. And then there's a tag attached to them. And then we do art abandonment and drop it in the community. So I've done this um, last year on election day. I put it all outside the place where people vote. Um, I've put them in parks, in restaurants, any kind of public place that I can abandon my artwork. And then when somebody finds it, the tag says, congratulations, you found a handmade piece of art that you can keep. And to read the story that inspired the artwork, go to projectcanary.org and input the story number. And it's a really a way of spreading stories and hopefully not letting those stories of injustice die. Um, the goal of the project was to make legislation real, because oftentimes there's this foreign idea of you know, politics and what happens. But really, it does impact people's lives. And the goal was to make that real. So you can participate. This project is ongoing. Um, you can read stories online. You can write and anonymously submit your personal story of injustice. You can craft objects, code them, and drop them in your community. And or you can organize a community work day. As a teacher, I've even done this with my own students. Um, finally, I want to talk about portion plates. And this is a project that I started in Omaha, Nebraska while I was on a residency. I collaborated with a health coach, and he created a focus group that brought people together that were interested in learning about nutrition and portion size. So with their input, I designed a place setting that was practical and useful. Um, we ate everything we consumed for one month off of this set of dishes. So even at a restaurant, they often serve you huge portions. But to choose and serve yourself on your own place setting really made you mindful of what, you, what and how much you were eating. Um, and I really wanted to answer the question, you know, we don't usually eat McDonald's off of handmade ceramics. So if you had to eat off of these dishes, how would that impact what you were going to choose to eat? Um, so the plates themselves, the plate was nine inches, and that was the average dinner plate size in the 1950s, and now they're much larger. Um, the bowl, you can see the change of color in the background, the lines where it goes from the yellow orange to the brown to the red. The first intersection of color denotes one cup. The second change of color, color denotes two cups. And then the small bowl, the change of color in the background was a quarter cup and a half cup. And the glass was 8 ounces, 12 ounces, and 16 ounces. So we were measuring what we were eating without depriving ourselves of dessert or snacks. And just hopefully it was making you mindful and conscious about what you were consuming. Um, in that, we started out by having a group dinner. And we ended with a group dinner. And we shared recipes online. We shared local food sources and different ways that, and, and experiences and interactions we've had with our dishes going out in the community even. Um, we had Thanksgiving off of them. When, we, when I went to a dinner party, a pizza party, I took it. And so it was really interesting to think about how eating off of those di dishes impacted what I chose to eat. Um, and that's one of my kind of personal rules of socially engaged art is that if I'm asking other people to do something, I'm participating in it, in it myself. It only feels fair and right to be experiencing it alongside them. Um, so re through reflecting on these projects, I have gained awareness and thoughtfulness with the people that I engage. Um, working with communities takes time and trust. You can't just show up somewhere and be like, hey, guys, we're doing this. Like You have to earn their trust. You have to build a relationship. Um, 
the goal of socially of socially engaged work for me is to make actual change, to make a difference, to make connections within a community. And if it's not authentic, if people feel taken advantage of, that ultimate goal is not going to be accomplished. So it has to be right. It, it's not something you can force. Um, and you have to set the stage and then let it evolve. Um, so although my biggest motivation is to create community and make connections, my largest fear is to ignorantly insult or harm people. And so every project I approach with as much research, as much talking to people, and as much listening as I can before I try to engage communities. Um, it has to be done in a highly sensitive fashion, and I know there's that risk, but I feel like if done with information, it can be beneficial to both parties. Art and handicrafts have the capacity to unite people, to preserve culture, help us understand each other, and safeguard the beauty of history. I strive to, te to retouch the lives of as many pe people as possible through my craft, community, and passion for humanity. Thank you so much. So as I mentioned earlier, in prepping for this panel, we had a really robust conversation, but we, uh, we talked about things like bridging cultural differences. We talked about engaging with our own communities and dialoguing within those communities. We asked ourselves how we could really build inclusivity beyond just donating or finding funding to go to causes. And we asked ourselves why some communities are still very homogenized when they can also be very welcoming. And as we were having this conversation, we felt it was really important to specify that today during our talk, no one is solving all of the world's problems. When you leave today, we hope that some of the questions and some of the ideas raised will resonate with you enough that you carry those ideas with you, that it opens a door for you to continue doing this work for yourself and in your community. We're not expecting um, any kind of resolution today, but we are really hoping for commitment. So with that, we have a couple questions to start with. Uh, the first one is, how does inviting people to participate in art making or interacting with an artwork foster change differently than inviting people to view artwork? Would anyone like to jump in first? Is there like a buzzer? <laughs> Make the noise. Well, um, this is, yeah. um, one of the things that I, I neglected to say at, from the onset of my uh, presentation is I think it's, it's wonderful to think about social engagement and social change in these larger ways where we're almost like playing truth or dare while making art. But sometimes a, a way of, of experiencing vulnerability together could be something as simple as I can't make this stand up, which is a very fundamental and physical thing. But when you share that, you know, it, it does create a bridge between people. So I'm trying to say is that engagement could mean a lot of different things. Um, I conduct a lot of different kinds of workshops, particularly in the high school, and one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is there could be 25 children in a, in a room for 15 weeks, and there are people who don't know each other's name in there. And I think that speaks volumes to what's not happening in that classroom. So, and specifically what I'm saying is we're not taking enough risks if that's the kind of thing that's not happening. We're not pushing the envelope and we're not struggling together as a community. And that's how we grow. So we can struggle over these bigger social questions and I'm not trying to trivialize them, but I also think that there are rich possibilities in stacking things. So for me, the act of like actually doing something together is bonding, whether that's sharing tea um, and conversation or creating together. Um, there's a philosopher named Octavio Paz that for me really defines the role of craft in the world. And he says that industrial objects 
are made to be efficient and minimal. And when you're done with them, you throw them out and they become trash. And art that is meant to be in a museum is looked at but not touched. And craft is something that you interact with, you hold. Think about how many very few things you actually put to your lips. And so the act of holding, using, physically interacting with an object, to me, is so much more powerful than only looking at it or having it be something industrial that really just becomes a burden in the end. I would add that making making something together um, for each other, not just making your own creation, also is uh, a way of place making, a way of linking people to their immediate community. Hello? Anybody? No. <laughs> Here you go. Or maybe they're working on it. Is it? Can you hear me? I don't think yours is on. I'm gonna borrow Lauren's. <laughs> Seems to be on now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Better? Yes. All right. <laughs> so in addition to um, what uh, these guys talked about in terms of sort of the risk of trying something new together, of making something together, um, I, I think there's a lot of value in making something that is collaborative or something that for each other, not necessarily making something just for yourself in the way that it can uh, facilitate bonds, in the way that it can help with placemaking, with linking people to to their community in, in, you know, in a way that might make it a little more likely for someone to say hello passing on the street or to strike up a conversation about that piece of art or to feel that that's theirs, like the space is theirs because I made part of it. So, I, I want to add something else. Um, when, I, when I taught high school, I had this romantic idea that all my students were supposed to go off and get BFAs. <laughs> and, um, it really did take uh, some time for me to, to realize what my role really was as the, the shaper of a community and, and in my efforts to use that space to, to create better citizens. And I specifically remember two young ladies who were, uh, and I wish the Union Project was around back then because they were always making ducks. And I was <laughs> like, I wish they would stop with these damn ducks and learn how to you know, build something that has some volume. But um, they came every single day to our after school program. And they just kind of giggled and walked around making these little ducks. And it just it really drove me crazy because I just didn't feel like there was much value in what they were doing. And, um, and one day I drove the two of them home. And I, I realized the part of town that they came from was, at the time, one of the roughest in Pittsburgh. And it, it helped me kind of reshape my role, particularly for these two young ladies, because you know, they needed a place to be safe. And I found the more I pushed them, the more they pulled away because they weren't ready to open up and become a part of us, you know, with the benchmarks and the expectations. They weren't they weren't willing to compete, and that's how they felt about what that space was. So it, it led me to believe that I wasn't really creating a safe space for them. And um, what later happened is I just said, well, they can load kilns and they can they can mix glazes and they don't seem to be intimidated by that. So they kind of became our, our unofficial kiln techs. And in time, these high school students, you know, really came into their own as as people who had voice. And I think that when I pushed them in other ways, their voices weren't cultivated. And I just think it's an important thing to think about the dimensions of how one can be a part of a community. Okay. So I think all of us have worked in clay and other materials. So let's talk about how clay is different than a different than a non-clay art form. Um, to use as a tool to engage community? I can ask the question in a different way. <laughs> you want a different way? I guess you could just say, why clay? Why, why clay? <laughs> I, can, I can jump in. Sure. Um, for, for me, it's that clay is the most instantly engaging, and I think it for people who aren't used to interacting with art uh, or art making, I think it inspires a certain fearlessness. It's great to be able to just, you know, something's not working out, so you crush it in your hands and start over, and that's okay. That's part of the medium. It's inherent. It's somehow safer than a line that becomes permanent on the sheet of paper or a brush stroke on a canvas. And I see people who enter the space 
really hesitant or you know unsure of themselves. You know, I can't make art. I'm not an artist, and really immediately become engaged. It, I don't know, there's something magical about clay, especially bringing into a classroom. It doesn't matter how difficult the classroom is, everyone just is drawn in really effectively. Um, for me, it's the ability to work additively and subtractively, so I can dig in, I can attach clay on, and nothing is permanent until you fire it. And I always really stress that to my students that you know, we find historical pots with people's fingerprints in thousands of years later, but until you choose to fire it, it can always become clay again. There's no commitment. There's no, you can feel free to take risks and fail without that sense of permanence. So for me, it's that and also the ability to use it to create craft, to, to make a utilitarian object that people can interact with in the way that Octavio Paz spoke about. I want to ask the question of the audience, and, and considering there's six or seven of my students in the audience, the, the pressure's on. Um, there's only one place in the world where local clay is not available. Does anyone know where that place is? Mr. Tavares? Hawaii. Hawaii. Anybody know why the answer to that is? Because it's volcanic. Gerald? Not old enough. Right? It takes time to make clay. Thank you, two of my students. Um, That's some bonus points. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess my answer is accessibility. And again, I have been awestruck since social media has really caught on that there are literal, literally things under a tarp on the side of my house that people in other parts of the world are building symposium around. So this idea that it really doesn't take much to activate community through ceramics if we think outside the box. You could fire stuff in your fireplace. I do that too. So we don't need we don't need a 220 power line. We don't unless you're in Hawaii, you know, you, you might not be able to get a, a dig on down the street. But for the most part, everywhere in the world we have a source of local clay. So I think we have time for one more question. And this is one that I think we really knocked our heads against. When thinking about the institutions involved with clay, museums, universities, probably other things, how can we make those institutions more inviting and more welcoming for um, people of color? And that's the question. What do you guys think? since I represent people of color, <laughs> I have to be the ambassador here. Let me just go first. <laughs> um, I was involved, and I have to answer anecdotally. You all probably get that about me already. Um, I was involved with a wonderful program with Penland Center for Crafts, um, and I taught for a historically black college about 10 years ago. And fortunately, Penland was gracious enough, their board of directors, to sponsor this program where I took, uh, you know, half a, excuse me, a dozen or two dozen students, depending on the semester, to Penland for a, a one or two day experience. And the premise behind that is, uh, is that in order to create a sustainable model for engaging populations who really aren't used to engaging, and I'm, I'm one of those kids who was considered weird because I went across the other side of town and made things with white people. And, and that was a, a very isolating thing. Like, dude, what are you doing hanging out with Warren McKenzie? Who's that old dude? You know, I was an urban kid. So the idea was kind of foreign. And, you know, and I guess in my case, the clay bug bit me at a very early age. And I didn't care who was around. But that bite doesn't happen the same for everyone. So sometimes it takes a little bit more time. So in this program with uh, Penland, you know, the idea was pretty much like the idea that I I came out of the program where somebody was with me for the start. And then they, they kind of let my hand go at a certain point. So it kind of, you got anybody old enough to know the movie Deliverance? So when, when I mentioned Penland, that was kind of the reaction that everybody had. You know, they're thinking, mountains, white people, um, not going to be a good, easy sale here. I don't care how much damn clay you have. Um, so, you know, it, it took kind of, you know, me going up there with them and saying, look, it's OK. And then getting to a point where they can come home and tell their friends. And then, they, then it took about three or four years before students were 
applying for those scholarship opportunities at Penland. But it wasn't something that I could just say, hey, opportunities at Penland. And I think that we have a lot of things like that. We have all these resources. And literally, you have, you have no idea how many wonderful scholarship opportunities there are available to students that are just waiting for the taking. And it's not easy to convince them, um, whether it's social economic, maybe I don't have the money, or just making that social plunge to feel like they're safe to be a part of that community. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, just like what we're here for, it's, a, it's something that we need to continually think about and, and not assume it's just as easy as resourcing and pointing someone in the right direction. Thinking about um, s scholarships, this is something I don't know that I have an answer to this question so much as other questions. Um, something um, I've been asking myself a lot around accessibility. Uh, we, we want our programs, uh, you know, our classes and workshops to be accessible to anyone regardless of socioeconomic status. And I often find myself wondering if the, even the process of scholarship becomes a barrier if having to go through that sort of that level of bureaucracy it creates um, enough of a barrier to, to keep people out um, who could benefit or could appreciate it. Uh, I'm not sure what the answer is in terms of process, or maybe you guys have other ideas. The answer but is persistence. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that we talked about after Theaster Gates' keynote speech here at Enseco mm -hmm. one year, um, we talked about how they created a multicultural fellowship and how maybe these people come once, but then what happens? Um, so I think two things. One is creating like that follow-up, that not just exposing them to it and letting them go and struggle or, or disappear, but continuously following up with them, giving them other little things to continue to draw them into the community. Um, and the second thing is making them feel a part of that community, making anyone feel a part of our community as, as a clay community, um, to have companionship and friendship and a feeling of belonging. That feeling of belonging will keep people coming back and then they'll invite their friends and hopefully, it will it it can grow. There's room for everybody, and so to continue to invite, include, and follow up, to continuously reach out, I think is some of the important things that we can all do. Because you were sighing a little bit. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I was recharging. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think that uh, I mean, of course, uh, this this country is a nation made of nations. So to speak about like nationality, mm -hmm. we do have communities, we have cultures, we have we even have microeconomies within our country that function, you know, on the behalf or in, in support of nations. And I think sometimes, you know, and I said this yesterday, you know, when we see a community within a community, there's some some that we're more accepting of with uh, than others. So you know, a black or Latino community, and in certain instances, are seen as as subversive or militant. But then we might see, uh, you know, uh, an Irish business district or a, a Korean or a Chinatown, and we don't see those areas at the same in the same way. So what I'm saying that to say is that, you know, people need to find their comfort zone in places. So it may not be so inviting for people to come here and see that there aren't few, aren't many people who look like them. But I think that it's it's important that they are received by a community. Um, I had a student from um, from China. And she tried full immersion. She was here for two years. And I told her that, you know, in order for you to be successful, you know, you need to find the local Chinese community. I had an exchange student. And people who are um, experiencing the same challenges, successes, as you, as they endeavor to be a part of something else. Okay. So we have about a half an hour left. And we do want to do something fun with you or something uh, thoughtful with you is probably a better word. Do you want to take over? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we have a list of statements, and for every statement that we read, I'm going to read some, and then we're going to pass it down. And for every statement that we read that applies to you, um, you're going to take a step forward. 
And if every statement, if that statement does not apply to you, you can you will take a step backward. And if you're not sure or you feel uncomfortable answering, you can stay where you are. And so we would like to kind of move some chairs and get in a line and see um, where our community privileges lie. So we um, should we have like everybody on this uh, stack, yeah. three or four chairs to the right. Sure. Yeah, because I think they're. Should we go this way? He said we had to go this way because. Of I think we're looking at doing the first couple rows of chairs on this side, not taking down all the chairs, because <laughs> we're gonna have to put them back. A front six rows, and then come on up. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yay. Um, so we're going to, I think we're going to start with a line kind of like this because we're going to, otherwise we're going to run into chairs. Yeah. So we're going to go this way. We're going to walk that way or back that way. In, yep. In the middle. Start in the middle. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> So I've also done this with my classroom. So for those of you who are teachers, this can also be done at school. And so, like I said, as I read a statement, take a step forward if you feel like it applies to you, and take a step backwards if it does not, and stay where you are if you are uncomfortable or don't know. Um, so I have a savings account with more than $500 in it. <laughs> All right. If needed, I can access resources through my family. Yes. <laughs> my elders and extended family are financially stable, and therefore I am not responsible for offering them financial support. More often than not, when my loved ones pass, they leave inheritance, not debt. The police never killed anyone I know. I don't know anyone that is currently incarcerated. For the majority of my life, I have had health care coverage. There were more than 50 books in my household growing up. More than 50 books. <laughs> I have never feared being hungry or homeless. I can get a loan or mortgage at a bank with little difficulty. <laughs> if I get sick or injured, I don't worry about whether I can afford to go to a doctor. Um, 
Milo? Up here. Great. There you go. I'm not exposed to street violence in the neighborhood where I live. I can and do take vacations on a regular basis. I can and do take vacations on a regular basis. I finished college. I am a US citizen. English is my primary language. I speak English without a noticeable accent. <laughs> People do not ask me, where are you from, based on my race or appearance. I have never been denied employment because of my race or ethnicity. I feel safe calling the police if trouble occurs. When I walk into a store, clerks do not assume I will steal something based on my appearance. I am never asked to speak for all members of my race. I see positive depictions of members of my race on most television and movies. Most of my teachers in school and leaders at work look like me. I can publicly show affection for my romantic partner without fear of judgment, ridicule, or violence. I can practice the religion of my choice and know that my sexuality will be accepted by its religious leaders. I have never been the target of violence because of my sexual orientation. I can apply for a job and not fear rejection because of my gender. I have never ever been sexually harassed. <laughs> I can travel alone at night without worrying for my safety. I can speak to a group, I generally, oh, excuse me, when I speak to a group of people, I generally feel empathy and connectedness. Am I doing the rest of these? <laughs> I, I missed the line. Yeah. I missed the cutoff line. I'm sorry. Okay. If I have children and a career, no one will think I'm selfish for not staying at home. The gender and name listed on my legal documents match the gender and name I use regularly. Others always use the correct pronouns when referring to me. I can easily find clothing for my gender that fits my body. Strangers and acquaintances do not ask what my genitals look like or what procedures I've had. I can shower at public facilities, such as gyms and pools, without incident. I can easily find housing that is physically accessible to me with no barriers to my mobility. I don't regularly need to rely on other people's help for tasks such as shopping or transportation. People don't make assumptions about my mental capabilities based on my physical status. Most of the time, I am not in pain. I do not have to ask organizers for special accommodations in order to participate in a class or a program. I can do well in a challenging situation without being told what an inspiration I am. Mm -hmm. 
So we went through cultural, disabilities, gender issues. I mean, there are so many things that give us privilege and make other people feel hindered to their success. So we can sit back down. You don't have to put the chairs back yet. We can do that at the end. But looking around you right now, look at where you are and think about your own privilege that you have and think about where it f how it feels to be standing where you are right now. And then we'll sit back down and hopefully have a kind of debriefing discussion and talk about your reflections and your privileges and other people's privileges. Stay down? Yeah, I'm up for that. All right, we'll pass the mic, um, but does anybody want to share um, how it felt to end up where you were and struggles, barriers that you see in your life or other people's lives? I will. Thank you. So I know this game. I should have started back there. Uh, there were only two, two uh, no's for me, um, sexual harassment and one of my students is incarcerated. And of course, th that student is of color. So, um, so then my response is one of confliction in that um, I have had the benefit of incredible white male privilege uh, uh, from a uh, middle class family. I have uh, uh, had a charmed life, and I'm painfully aware of that and that others don't get that. Um, and so, you know, sort of my task then becomes how do I best um, include and, and open um, without falling into the I'm reaching down and helping all of you. Um, it it gives me it gives me a lot of confliction in my life in term in terms of reflecting on that. I mean, I think that's a it's, it's an astute observation. And if you are one who experiences all of that privilege, best believe there are people who have the privileges that that you have that don't have the empathy for other people. And I think that that could uniquely position you to, um, to I guess, to help people cultivate a soul who don't otherwise have one. So I think it, it's a little different. You know, somebody said, not to me, but you know, I had my white guilt for the week, you know? And, and there are a lot of people who have those kinds of attitudes. Or, you know, why is it my fault that I'm a white male? You know, so, um, I think that, you know, we, I, I say often in every forum I have ever had in the last two years, I say the heart is a muscle. And the way that muscles work is if we don't continue to work them and then we come back and try to work them, we feel fatigue and soreness, right? So if, if you're an Olympic athlete, no matter how good you are, if you take off a year and you go back like you're still training for the Olympics, it's going to kick your ass. And I think, as again, I mentioned the world's changing perpetually. So that, that being said, you can't say, OK, I made it. I'm a liberal. <laughs> I get it, everybody, right? Because there's always new ways of life, new ways of thinking, new ways of existing for us to consider and be sensitive to. So I'm saying that we, we have to continue to work out and, and invite people to work out with us by challenging them. I'll just add one thing to that. I was interviewing. A Nathan Murray, he's a um, partial African American and partial, um, his mom is white from Nebraska. And before interviewing him, I said, I feel very self conscious and very like, I don't know what it's like to be a, a you know, half African American, half white male living in Nebraska. He's like, Well, I don't know what it's like being a white woman. And so to not look at 
like each one of us are individuals and each one of us has our own experiences and our own backgrounds that are unique. So, you know, not looking at it as I'm reaching out, but I'm offering what I have to offer. Everybody has something to offer and to look at each other as equals and it is everybody's responsibility to include each other in what we do. Um, hi, my name is Amanda. Um, I'm a student at the Maine College of Art. And um, I think my favorite word that I've been really uh, focused on studying the last year from being in art school is intersectionality. Um, I did not know that word until I came to the Maine College of Art. And afterward, it like completely changed my viewpoint on everything because I began to realize that you can be a person who has certain privileges but is disadvantaged in other ways. And so over the last year, I've been having conversations with my friends about like, well, yeah, like this person, you know, is a person of color. And so maybe they go to a school where they want to give them a scholarship because they want them to be their token person of color. And so, and like that has its own issues and I don't want to get into that. But, um, you know, it was interesting that like his perspective on people of color was like, oh, they have this privilege because they're being led into our school because they present this aspect of diversity. But I was like, yeah, but like, did you ever consider the fact that like they can't walk down the street without fearing for their life? You know, and so it's it's been really incredibly eye-opening to me to think about where other people come from and the struggles that they might face that I'm not aware of and the struggles that I face that other people aren't aware of. Um, so I think the bottom line that we all need to come to is a place of compassion and just really recognizing that we're all human. And that's something that's severely lacking in our administration that I'm really hoping will change in the next few years. So thank you. <laughs> just to add to that, I think it's one of my takeaways from this exercise is that it's a reminder that all of our privileges and identities are not necessarily visible as you're stepping forward and back, you may have been surprised by, wait, you know, wh why are they going back in this moment? Like, we can't necessarily see, we can't necessarily make an assumption that, you know, the young, healthy looking white guy sitting in the front of the bus and, the, and not standing up for the pregnant woman, like, is he being rude or does he have an invisible disability? So it's an important reminder, I think, in that way, too. Tie into what you said and about compassion. Um, I think about the ability to people to innately have compassion and to not have it. And if anybody has a tangible way to bridge that gap and find a way to get those people who are able to make decisions without compassion who get advanced and do things that suit them or need them, you know, to their own needs. Like, is there a way? so that we're kind of taking care of everybody? Does anybody have a way to reach out to those people who don't care? Um, I, don't I, have to. Say about that. I think we are in a, obviously we're in a very uh, interesting time. We can, argue not, we can argue whether or not we think we're in a, a pickle with regards to what's happening to this country. But we're definitely, in my view, in a time of the anti-intellectual. Um, which means that we're in a time where we celebrate and we give platforms, huge platforms, to ignorance. And something someone said to me recently really stuck with me is that we have, we have violence and we have intellect. And I think getting us to a place where people are being inclusive and considering other points of views and, and really thinking, thinking about how to feel is coming from the intellect and not those who want to shut down. So there are many people who believe that your views challenge my views. So this is not a safe space. In fact, I'm taking a, I'm on guard because of how you feel. Not you personally. <laughs> but but I, I think that that is, is becoming, you know, more and more prevalent. And I think it's largely because we're not, we're, we're not really moving into embracing into intellect. And I think that, you know, that's part of the problem. We're, Lack of exposure, we're not, we're not thinking to feel. Um, for me, I try to explain to people that what is best for you is what is best for everybody. Um, people who say, well, I don't want to pay for 
you know, social services. But if somebody has a hand in getting a job, then they are a more productive member of society. And ultimately, that's better for everybody. And so what's best for one is best for the whole, in my opinion. Um, and the other way for me to answer, try to answer that question a little more directly is to, to get personal stories. I think that is the ability of art, is it's not some abstract thing. It makes it concrete. It, make, it reaches people's emotions. And so for me, that's one of the roles that art plays in society is reaching people and making them feel. You can say, oh, I don't want to sponsor a food program. But if you see a picture of someone starving, it reaches you in a different way, that photograph, than just reading or hearing those words. And so for me, art is so important, especially in times like now, when we need to reach people on an emotional level and make them make their decisions from their heart and not from their head all the time. Just one minute. OK. Should we take one more? So first, I'd like to thank you. My heart muscle is going pretty fast right now, so <laughs> appreciate that. I think I'm growing, yeah, um, working that out. Um, so I served five years in the military, and I think that um, the dividing line there is enlisted or officer, and that is financially defined. So um, uh, I also moved from Canada to South Florida, where I was immersed in a lot of different situations that I didn't have to deal with. You know, I approached people of different cultures with curiosity, and um, I think traveling the world really defines the economic status of, of certain areas. And um, I did a project called Eye Level, where you take a picture of eyes, and then you exhibit the eyes and the experience, but not the name and, and not the circumstance and not the things that people usually attach to certain things, um, and that kind of... Um, just approaching it and realizing where the segregation really lies. And for me, that's financial, and that's across all of the places I've visited. So, you know, I, I think that not using the words that define people as a societal thing that we say we understand, you know, accepting that that terminology is older, you know, and that it doesn't define people. You know, like a woman is not the same thing as, you know, everything else, you know, that every other woman is. So just, I think, identifying that the segregation is not of color or gender. It's really our biggest problems are economic. That goes to what Milo was saying about invisible disability or diversity. You can't sure. always tell financially how somebody is just yeah, by exactly. looking at them. Mm -hmm. yeah.